Okay. Yeah, it, should doesn't be. A, it doesn't seem to be a weird feedback loop uh, now. So. Yeah, I should be okay now. I don't, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Uh, I'm just checking the sound should be okay now. Mm. So maybe it's, uh, we're good to start. Okay. Uh, welcome, uh, friends, uh, to Miston Mountain Off the Talk program. Uh, this program is organized uh, by Miston Mountain Creative Residency in collaboration with the Scottish Book Trust. And uh, uh, we invite uh, creatives, uh, authors, poets, and uh, some of our uh, guests in the past uh, were uh, John Burnside, uh, Kathleen Jemmy, Dr. Wen Price. Uh, Today, we are proud to welcome Dr. Helen Lynch, a writer and a creative writing lecturer at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, and uh, we, Mission Mountain has nearly 5,000 uh, viewers all over the world, and I hope uh, this will be recorded and it will be kept uh, in the Mission Mountains Facebook uh, as well as YouTube as well. So those who can't join the live program can uh, join later on. And, uh, uh, how are you today, Dr. Helen? I'm good, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And yeah, thank you very much for having me. That's uh -huh. fantastic. Yeah, before we go further, I would like to say that uh, uh, Helen Lynch, Dr. Helen Lynch is a short fiction writer. She teaches literature and creative writing at the University of Aberdeen and is the co-director of Word Center for Creative Writing. Her first collection, The Elephant and the Polish Question, is a collection of interlinked stories set in Poland during the collapse of communism. And a second, Tea for the Rent Boy, completed with the help of a writer's bursary from Creative Scotland, came out in 2018. Other work includes books on 17th century politics and poetry, and two interactive online resources for school children, Behul for Beginners, and The Night and the Lion. She also plays with Salad Dan Band Dance Macabre, and is creative director for the North Northeast annual youth-led Literary Cross Arts Festival, Weirwood. Uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll know more about the salad later on. We'll, uh, okay. uh, that might be of interest. And today, uh, to start with, uh, can you tell me something about yourself? Uh, how was your early days like and where did you grow right. up? Okay, well, um, I was born in London. I was born in South London. Um, and I grew up in Hampshire in the country in a in an area near a village called Wickham and the area that I grew up in is actually called Chipple and it's a, it's in the Beer Forest so it's in the Meon Valley um it was a market gardening area so it was quite a rural area there was a pub there still is a pub um and a river and a forest and some houses and yeah I've got a bus to school and yeah so I grew up there and then I went to university in York um my family originally came you know um, the Irish part of my family anyway came from Scotland and then Liverpool and then East London. So I, I kind of wanted to go north when I when I did my um, degree. So I went to the University of York and then after that I spent some time in Poland. So between 1987 and 1993, which is where partly where the material for the, the first collection comes from. So mm -hmm. yes, is that enough information? Well, so, I mean, uh, as you say that, you uh, what attracted you to Poland? What was... Uh... Uh, what made you go there? Well, it was it was it was really rather random in the sense that I didn't. Um, it turns out I had some ancestors from Eastern Europe, but I didn't actually know that at the time. Um, and they're from Bohemia. They're from Prague and 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 that part. So I didn't have any prior knowledge of Eastern Europe at all. The University of York had a had an exchange scheme it was a kind of one-way exchange scheme because in those days people couldn't come very easily from eastern europe to the west um the, the west as it was then called and so uh, the university of york used to send some sort of graduate students really to go and teach english literature and language in the university of Łódź, um which is spelt lods if you've ever seen it on the map 
um and yeah it was a, it was a kind of one way one way trip um and yes fantastically like it just came up and i was i was i'd finished my degree and i was doing a postgraduate ma in renaissance literature and my then boyfriend was writing a phd which he seemed to me to be taking a very long time about <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was like, oh, I can't wait around here. I'm going to, you know, go off and do something. And it, I just bumped into somebody who'd done the who'd done this exchange before. And um, and so I just wrote to the head of department and said, oh, no, no, it's full. There's no, there's no space. But then something happened to one of the people. They, they got an opportunity to go do something else. And so, yeah, by total chance, I went to Poland with no no real prior knowledge. Um, of the place and somehow during 1981 you know during the solidarity period i had managed to be living in a in a place which had no tv mm -hmm. so i hadn't really got i had really got incredibly little prior knowledge of, of poland when i went which was quite nice actually it was a sort of total immersion experience linguistically and in every other in every other respect mm -hmm. uh, uh we have uh we might have viewers maybe uh if uh, viewers can unmute themselves and you know we'll have a chance to ask questions uh, at last. Okay. Uh, and uh what influence did you write when did you first think that you want to become a, a writer i when i was a child i think i wanted to be a writer because that was just but I, well i think i wanted to be an illustrator i think as a child i thought i used to draw stories so i used to sit there with scrap paper and old diaries and out, you know and and draw pictures and tell the stories in my head mm -hmm. um, so i guess i guess and i think yes i think if i had an ambition at all uh, it was it was towards you know i don't know being a being a magazine or a comic illustrator where you could tell stories by drawing the pictures i think that was my first idea um and yeah so we had i we, we when i was a child we because we lived in the country and there weren't many buses or very much to do we had three 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 other children so i have a sister and brother and i had a friend from nursery school called faith eckersall who's also a writer and the two of us where we were the eldest so it was our job to entertain the two little ones in each of our families so we would tell them so we would make up stories for them um she was a very she was a bestseller i'm telling you <laughs> She was, she was very, uh, we used to frighten them half to death, I think, with the stories we used to tell them. But anyway, so I guess that's where storytelling really started. We would be in a, in a tent in the garden or something or having sleepovers and telling them stories. But then I went to university, of course, and, and, and studied literature. And I think that kind of, I don't know, they're all very good, those people you study. <laughs> they're all intimidatingly good and mostly men. Um, so... And I think that's, yeah, I think that's, I guess, one of the, one of the reasons, you know, it is really important to have lots of, a huge diversity of people to see doing the things that you're interested in doing, because it felt to me like there was only Angela Carter and Angela Carter is wonderful and marvelous, but I knew I couldn't be Angela Carter. <laughs> so, so I guess, so I stopped kind of writing fiction at that point and started just writing essays. Um, but when I went to Poland, I started I started writing very long letters because it took a very long time for a letter. It took three weeks for a letter to get to the UK from Poland in those days. Wow. So it was really <laughs> worthwhile making them full of full of stuff. So, yeah, so these 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 the, I think these were the, the germs of the of the stories that I later wrote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you uh, you wrote uh, Tea for the Rent Boy while you're in Poland, is it? No, I wrote, I wrote the elephant in the Polish question. Oh, sorry. The elephant. There we go. A bit of product placement. There you go. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> we were, uh, yeah. So I wrote this. I, I started writing it in Poland, but it took me. I, I, I kind of wrote some of the individual stories and I sent off various individual stories over the next 10 years or so. And I had some children. Um, and yes, I think the occasional story would appear one place or another. But at a certain point, it was just kind of this is part of an issue with the short story world in general mm. um and part of the reason i've been fortunate to publish collections is because it, it takes almost as long to get a single story published as it would get to persuade somebody to let you do a collection mm -hmm. um and even though i mean my friends who are writers um especially friends who write novels as well they get a lot of you know 
stick they want to publish their short story collections and they're told i'll write another couple of novels first or you know even though uh, all the evidence is that people really like short stories the problem is that short stories are not um you know and then short stories are ideal for reading on planes and trains and everywhere else you kind of if you go into a bookshop you have to know who you're looking for or what you're looking for and they're published by author they're not there isn't a shelf with short where you could just go and look at everybody's short fiction and take one off the shelf so so yes so that i i was very fortunate i i put in i i entered a short story competition with blue chrome press and the nice thing about it was you could enter two short stories which mm. was sort of slightly felt like you could you could show you didn't have to kind of put all your eggs in one basket because this is the short story that represents everything i do and the prize was to be able to publish a collection of 10 i think it was short stories of your own um and i was very lucky and i won the prize and i managed to persuade them that because it was coming up to 2009 that instead of publishing 10 short stories of mine which that they should publish 16 short stories <laughs> set in set in poland um in time for the anniversary of the fall of the berlin wall so i'm very very grateful to them because they they agreed to do that mm -hmm. so this was the, this was the result yeah, I mean, talking about the short stories was quite. Uh, uh, what do you think? Because there's a saying, you know, especially during, in video writing classes, uh, the students come up with, well, well short story is more hard, hard to write because you need to figure out the end and it has to be very precise. Uh, you can't just go on, on and on like a novel. So, what do you think? Uh, uh, since you have both experience and you are a creative writing tutor as well, I'm uh, sorry, lecturer as well. So, what do you think uh, is. Is it hard to write a short story or? A... I, I don't really know because I haven't actually, I've never written a novel. Um, and, but in, in writing the, I think, I feel like writing a novel would be easier because you, you kind of have more elbow room. You can't, um, and I, yes, you have, you have more space. I, I, I mean, in writing, I wrote these two um, back in the nineties when I had very small children, um, I did write uh, these kind of translation come interactive uh, educational resources for children on the very sort of early days of the internet. <laughs> um, so they're really kind of a bit like, I don't know if you remember those little flick books you used to have which yeah. where you could choose uh -huh. the ending and you could go off and so mm. yes, you get to choose, you get to choose, in fact, the Beowulf one, for example, you just get more Beowulf, but you don't realise you get some of the digressions or you get, or you get to go off and find out about the son who shipped burial or Anglo-Saxon diddles or something. So that was that was the model. And I had a daughter who was, you know, six months old or something, and she would go to sleep and I would immediately, I mean, this this super technology, I'm afraid my friend Susan Dunbar was responsible for the technology part. I was scribbling with a pen. I'd just sort of roll over and scribble with a pen. And it was fabulous because you knew, okay, you're working with the translation in a way. So you've got something already there. Um, but I feel a novel would be more like that, that you're kind of just, oh, I'm going to write this bit today. Whereas with a short story, it, yes, it is, as you say, very tight and and very difficult. I mean, and I, I don't think I started writing short stories from lack of confidence, essentially, that I didn't think I had anything to say or anything to write about that was big enough to turn into a novel, mm -hmm. um, which is a rubbish reason for doing it, because, <laughs> as, as you say, they are actually quite hard. Um, and the thing I I don't know if people out there who write feel this, but it's very, and I certainly struggle with this a lot, is that I, I don't have a problem with the opening sentence. I often have a really quite strong sense of the beginning. And then there's the bit where you're either, you're introducing backstories for people and, and you're kind of, and that bit I find really hard not to kind of make too, too big. It just gets out, of, it's sort of like a boa constrictor with a very big bulge in its neck. Yeah. I can't. I can't, I find that, I get, I don't know, I get too interested in the backstories of the people. I feel that too much is, is, is crucial. And before you know it, somehow this nice tight beginning has sort of spread into this huge, great bulge. And then the rest of the story is also, it's also, less, I don't know, I don't struggle with that, but I don't know if people out there feel the same. It's really hard because you're, that's where your kind of imagination is starting to make this story be worthwhile for you to tell and for other people to hear it which is that you're inventing the characters and you're inventing things that are going to make people believe it um mm. 
it's not about style somehow at this point and yeah it's very hard not to just kind of because your imagination has to you have to make them up i know hemingway says all this macho stuff about you know tips of icebergs and leaving it all out and stuff it's really hard to leave stuff out once you've made it up you're kind of fond of it mm -hmm. so i don't know i don't know do you find do you find this and do you when you write uh you know short story i, I mean it's quite hard for me you know i've been uh, I'm, i've been uh, writing a novel so it's, it's taken me quite um a good number of years <laughs> but uh, right, yeah. so you can you can tell me that it's a complete delusion that novels are easier yeah no what, what i was trying to uh ask you is uh when you think of a short story what's hard for do you, is it very really hard for you to begin or uh, you want to say that okay no this should be the ending or i need to figure out what's the hardest part is it uh, is it to begin or to end you know because for me ending is very difficult i don't know where to end you know so I, I, I don't know. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, the story often just starts with a sentence and I quite like a sort of desultory, not very exciting sentence. I don't know. It's just something that comes into my head. Um, yeah, I think nearly all the beginnings of my stories are sort of like, look like they come out of nowhere. I find those quite easy. And I somehow, usually I know where the end is. Sometimes it doesn't end up where I thought it was so, so very often I have a kind of ending sentence but I I and the structure seems to work except for this bulge I mean this is my this is that the, the bit which is the sort of inventive bit of of, of peopling it properly mm. so mm -hmm. I, that doesn't seem to be but the other thing I find and I, I think other people probably find this is, is difficulty is believing in it long enough I don't know how you do that with the novel um because you, you know you start off and it's all very exciting and then you have all the inventive bit and you're making up loads of stuff and that's all fun um you know you might feel oh i'm going on a bit but i'll cut this out later you think fondly and then you you know you keep going and about i don't know say two-thirds of the way through i i always find there's a kind of well a it's all kind of somehow gone horribly wrong and, and this fabulous conception is somehow not working um the thing you were really excited about high about two days ago is somehow just kind of evaporated or slipped through your fingers or not getting or or there's a moment where you just think well who the hell cares i mean who mm. apart from me who the hell gives the monkeys about about this thing that i'm so <laughs> preoccupied with um and i think the point at that point i have learned it took me a long time because i just used to stop at that point so i used to have an awful lot of stuff that was two thirds um um finished and, and and then lose faith in it and the, the trick is to make yourself finish it because mm -hmm. you can go back and edit it a um i mean or certainly not throw it away which is another thing that i always have to tell my students do not junk it do not delete things um mm -hmm. because because what changes is how you feel about it. sometimes if you if you put it away and you come back in two months or three months and you look at it and you go it's not that bad um it's not as bad as you remembered it and or the thing that you thought was wrong with it suddenly seems sol solvable you can you you know what to do with it or you you know and just the fact that it's slightly unfamiliar after all this time when you've read it from the beginning through to where you got stuck or through to where you know actually that started your brain working and actually it's quite obvious what you should do what you should do to solve this problem so i yeah i just advocate putting it away and waiting <laughs> a lot but don't yeah don't chuck it because it's the you feel you can look at exactly the same piece of work and this is true of academic work or any kind of thing where you're using your energy and your your mind to make something that you look the way that you feel about it is not necessarily at all related to what it's actually like mm -hmm. it's related to other things so. we have uh, uh we have viewers uh, uh from different countries uh there's a I'll just uh, read. Uh, Sanjay Saxena says, very nice. Uh, I don't know where Sanjay is from. And uh, uh, so we welcome all the audience. And in the end, there'll be uh, time for questions as well. So mm -hmm. you can just put the questions at the back of the Facebook uh, message. And I'll, I'll read that out to Helen and okay. she can answer the last. Oh. And uh, once again, 
Uh, we'd love to hear more about the T for the Rent Boy. You know, the, the name was quite interesting, you know, T for the Rent Boy. And uh, 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 what made you, uh, what, what is the story about and what was the main story? Like, uh, what, what well, made you? it's kind hmm. of, because T, T for the Rent Boy, more product placement, is, um, it was a collection of stories, some of which I wrote a long time ago, some some of which I wrote relatively recently. And I, it was always called it was called Tea for the Rent Boy for for ages and ages. And all and actually I hadn't written a story called Tea for the Rent Boy. Um where I um my ex-partner had a flat in the centre of town, which features in the story Tea for the Rent Boy, in the centre of Aberdeen, if you ever want to go there. Um and outside. The the, the 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 story is set looking out onto this this rather fi fine square but it's behind the what used to be the theater the music hall um and it used to be the pink light district so um there was, was there was a, there was a real there was a real character um a real person who mm -hmm. who informed the character of 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 said rent boy but i didn't i'd written when i i wrote all the other stories and i got everything together and i was like yes now I, I went back to my little folder which had tea for the rent boy in it and it had like a paragraph and some notes and i'd always assumed that i had more than that so i had to write that one kind of from scratch and unsurprisingly it turned into almost one of the longest ones um but yes i'd been i just liked the title so much and i'd been calling my my uh well collection my, my prospective collection tea for the rent boy and you know, taking it to publishers and it was going to be published and they'd accepted it on the synopsis with that title. And I thought, well, I either I had enough. I mean, I had enough stories. I just thought, well, I either have to I didn't want to change the title. So I have to write that story. So, yes, mm. it's a it's a complicated story about relationship breakup and boundaries and prostitution and mm. sex work. Um, I mean, it's not. Yes it's well you'll have to read it. it's the last one it's the last uh, one in the, in the collection yeah. but I, I did i did i did write the story in order to be able to still call my collection tea for the rent boy because i i just liked the phrase but yes there you will discover that the main character does indeed give tea to the rent boy mm -hmm. that's that's wonderful uh, do you have a structure schedule to write or are you flexible like uh, how is it how does the day go like is there is there a fixed time that you have set up writing um well obviously uh, i teach in the university so i'm teaching a lot it's really hard to keep writing when you're teaching um mm -hmm. there you are i mean when you take you take the job because you're supposed to be given time to write and you're supposed to be given time to do research and if you're a creative writer that would include um creative writing but it's uh, it's quite hard to get very much done during the teaching term um the i think the tr the thing i discovered with um so did i have i don't yes i did i did have well i, I managed the, the writer's bursary gave me some time i i work better in the mornings personally um mm -hmm. but i did also discover and i discovered this from a fellow academic uh which was about writing academic work which is that people who write regularly and a little bit produce more than people who wait till they've got time mm -hmm. and space and headspace and opportunity even though that is important so um i had a little notebook and i just <laughs> tried tried to do you know because it will move forward if you do a little bit you know not, if, if you can't do a little bit every day, then you can do a little bit on the days that you can do it and you keep a record of it, it will creep incrementally up. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of what mm -hmm. happened. But yes, but I, I'm also I also write um, academic books. So at the moment, I'm writing, and I kind of alternate them. Somehow that seems to be how it works. So at the moment, I'm right, I'm you know, thinking about the 17th century and politics and poetry and john milton and things wow. like that so and gender so yes well yeah so it's it, it they i mean i thought when i start i thought it would be great because i could when i was had writer's block i would be able to write academic stuff and when i was you know 
sick of sick of that, I would be able to swap around. That kind of works in the sense that, yeah, last summer I wrote a short story when I was supposed to be doing something else. Um, so yeah, I quite often find mm. I do the one I'm not supposed to be doing, but I think that says something about human nature and obligation. We don't like having to do things. So, uh, so do you mean to say that you don't have to, let's say, if you're writing uh, short stories and do you switch between uh, writing short stories and write, writing academic stuff or do you have to clear ahead before you go to the next you know <laughs> because i've seen some well, people it's <laughs> at the moment i'm not i mean i mean i wrote i wrote a short story last summer and at the moment i haven't i haven't written any fiction since was it last summer it might have been two summers ago um so yeah at the moment i haven't written any fiction for a while i occasionally have really good ideas and write them down and scribble lots of things down about them but if i don't do something about it straight away i forget about it and then i look at it later and go that was a really good idea where's all the stuff i wrote on that and it's all on bits of paper and i try to put all the bits of paper in the same place so that i can at least find it when i can come mm -hmm. to it but no at the moment i'm trying to i'm trying to finish something else and yeah covid and lockdown and other things have intervened a bit yeah uh, maybe we'll uh if, if uh, do you have something to read you know and before we oh um yeah well let me think what could i read um well when you asked me so this is from teeth in the rebel when you asked me about i think you uh, i think you said you you wondered who who i read one of the myself and i said <laughs> i said i wasn't angela carter which is true uh when i was studying at york i did a module on medieval romance which was wonderful um and i uh, one of the writers i really loved on, on this course was marie de france so and she's always married to france circa 1170 they usually say um because nobody really knows who she was um but she wrote these wonderfully delicate sort of suggestive really they're short stories they're lays i mean she wrote um she did um versions of aesop's fables and other things but these lays were kind of arthurian um stories uh but but really but short beautifully short and and yes in this in this lovely lovely language where everything is inferred and you you it's just an incredibly atmospheric and beautiful um so i and i'd always wanted she she wrote a story called laustic which is the nightingale which is a sort of um it's a it's a love story with two knights and, a, and one lady uh but i and uh, i guess i wanted and, and because she's circa 1170 i i wanted to write this and i i didn't make it about two knights and a lady i made it about a slightly agoraphobic person and a child but um I decided to set it in the 1970s in Yorkshire instead of in, in, in. so that yeah, this is called Blackbird and I'll just read a wee bit of it and see, yeah. see what you think. Um, I couldn't say it's typical because I think they're all a bit weirdly different in this collection. Okay, so it's called Blackbird with Gratitude the Marie de France circa 1170. She packed in her job at the post office, quite senior she'd been in the finish, but Norman didn't want his wife working when there was no need. You stop at home love and make things nice. So she did stop at home and make things nice. She quite transformed the sitting room. They had a new suite put in and there were fitted units with daisy patterned formica for the kitchen. And of course she didn't expect to be alone for very long, though she wasn't so young now, 40 or thereabouts. Still, she seemed to find plenty to do. She was a wise, resourceful, courteous sort of person. Norman had seen that in her. It was part of what he deemed a touch of class. Comely too, with large teeth and brown hair. Joy was her name. It was to a small pebble dash semi that Norman brought, brought her home after the wedding. A quiet registry office do. It was his second after all, and of course her parents wouldn't be coming. Just a few of her girlfriends, his sisters, and Keith and Eileen on his side. They would be neighbours when all's said and done, even if they weren't the best example of married bliss themselves. Besides, Keith was Norman's mate, had been for years. She'd worn a peach suit, her joy, and a hat that even he considered a bit daft, so it wasn't at all showy. It somehow brought out the shining, almost quivering quality of her face. It made him nervous, too dewy-eyed for his taste, with that little veil. Life wasn't a bed of roses. It wasn't how she'd looked that day at the social club, crammed in the corner with the other girls, their smooth tan nylon legs all jumbled up and overlapping as they reached for their shandies on the copper-topped table. She'd seemed more refined, more sophisticated than the others. 
Mind you, she kept herself well with her neat cuffs and silky blouses, her frosty pink lipstick and well-styled hair. Come to think of it, this hat too was quite stylish with those tiny lilies. Perhaps it was the colour or the occasion. It was odd seeing Keith and Eileen out together for once. Keith and Norman went back a long way, having started in the same month in the same department at British Rail Engineering. When the time came, they'd bought not adjoining semis, but the two end houses nearest one another, only a gravel driveway and a pair of garages between. Not that they ever used the garages. Keith walked to work, while Norman had never lost the habit of parking his car on the street, like a getaway car his first wife had once commented in exasperation, having to wheel the pushchair around it to get in her own front gate. Norman remembered when Keith had married Eileen, a dark pointy-faced girl, not long after his own first wedding. Now the couple rarely crossed paths, even at home, except for ritualised rows. Eileen drank a bit more than was good for her, it was said, and Keith kept well out of it when he could. Even so, they'd raised three children, more or less, though only one at home now, their afterthought. At least Eileen had resisted the urge to go off with anyone else, more than could be said for Norman's own first wife, who'd upped and off, dragging both kids along with her. It had taken him a long time to get over that, a long time. Yet he and Keith had stayed friends. He a bachelor again, and Keith happy to be out of the road if he could. Though no longer in the same department, they would meet for a drink after work. The two of them were in a group. Among their peers, they were well-known and well-respected men, fond of a game of darts and a pint of beer, not slow to buy their round or over keen to hurry home, sensible and honest men. Until one day, Norman surprised them all and married Joy, carried her off against her parents' will, so it was said. Not that anyone had known a thing about it, he kept it right quiet. Even Keith didn't get much warning. Still, the word gets out and there were jokes in the pub. Some bright spark put she's leaving home on the jukebox as Norman walked in and they all had a good laugh. Norman took it well. Perhaps he should have had a honeymoon after all, he reflected, though they'd preferred to spend the money on the house. Naturally, Norman didn't come into the wagoners as much at first. As for Joy, she'd really made a difference to that place of theirs, the few who saw it in the months after the wedding reported. She had such taste in a quiet way and she kept it all beautifully clean. There was a place for everything and everything in its place, from Norman's neatly pressed shirts on the wardrobe shelf to her own knickknacks precisely arranged on the bureau, cufflinks and handkerchiefs, the sweet-smelling socks and underwear, a different scent for each compartment, lavender and sandalwood and lemon verbena, right down to her own drawer of fancy scarves. She would pore over these by the hour, laying them side by side, seeing the effect. She thought she would have children, but none came. Perhaps they should see someone about it, a doctor, though she was afraid. Norman seemed not to be concerned, yet she'd barely broached the subject with him. She knew, no more than, wouldn't it be lovely if we had a kiddie, Norman, now and then? What do you want to be doing with all that for, all that muck and racket, he'd reply easily. He always seemed to be going out the room as he said it, so she couldn't answer him properly. Or once, warming to his theme, wouldn't be much left for your neat, tidy house now you've got it so nice. Wouldn't have your rooms just so then, I can tell you, not with kids about, like a bloody hurricane they are. You'd wear yourself to the bone, just cleaning up after them, I can see you. She took his teasing well, for all she found it quite unkind. Probably she deserved it, she was a fusspot with her tidiness. And in truth, he didn't think she could stand it, she seemed that frail and nervous these days. He'd noticed it before, during their courtship, seeing her only after work. He'd not noticed it before, during their courtship, seeing her only after work, and once or twice with that family of hers. And though not at all in all respects an observant man, more and more she struck him as not quite right. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> uh, we've got a, a message. It's a very informative and inspiring session going on uh, from Pushkar. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so this was, uh, is this in the, included in the collection, is it? That's in the collection, yeah. It's, it's in the collection. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, because they are a collection of short stories that I wrote over a very long period of time, it's always really hard to choose one to read because they mm. really are, I think, quite different. I mean, I think something holds them together and some preoccupations recur. Mm. Um, but I think the voices in them all are all quite different. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. you know, and the they're set in different times and different places. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's it's really and it's also, also very hard to always always very hard to pick an extract from a short story because they're so short anyway it feels kind of, kind we'll, of we'll, uh, we'll kind of uh, put uh, the link that you sent so if any anybody wants to buy then we can mm -hmm. uh, we'll put a link at the Mist and Mountains Facebook page and you can go over there and uh, uh, buy Helen's book uh, there, are some, there are some used ones on Amazon I noticed yeah, yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's 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 informative again. <laughs> let's are available, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what what uh, since you were a creative writing uh, lecturer as well, what piece of advice would you give to aspiring uh, writers, uh, poets, you know, as a teacher? What uh, well, I, apart from don't throw it away, um, <laughs> uh, I, well, I, I guess do it. I mean, you don't, I mean, lots of us, I mean, including me, you know, spend years of years of our lives wishing we could write, thinking we might be able to write, wondering if we could write. But the truth is you get better and better by doing it, hopefully. Well, I hope I get better. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> you, find yourself a situation where you will write things whether it's a an educational situation a group of people another group of people are very good um talk courses are very good you know but obviously from the cost of money um so you can't assume that everybody can afford to do that but there are creative writing groups but where you'll be set think you'll be get to see what other people do and you'll get encouragement from other people um and yes, you, you, you'll be set tasks that you wouldn't normally engage in, I think, because quite often people find, um, certainly with creative writing, you know, very often the dissertation, the final piece of work that people write is, is on something they never imagined. You know, it's a sci-fi narrative poem or something that they would never have come across. So it's, it is really good to get a group of people. It's also, I mean, one of the things that I do in, in every class that I teach is I always pair people up so that you have a kind of buddying system for writing because it really when I was writing I think it was the, yes I was writing short stories for this and I used to have an office next door to my colleague Alan Spence who was writing a novel he was writing the novel Nightboat and we used to send each other sections um, and then knock on the wall and go for a coffee and it was lovely because it meant you tidied it up enough to be not embarrassing for somebody else to see it meant you had a bit of a deadline and a destination um we weren't going to be too mean to each other because we were both in the same boat and we were both trying to trying to finish stuff but on the other hand we would see things that the other person you know didn't see about the work so you know it's, it's a supportive relationship um you know we weren't about to say to each other forget it don't give up the day job it's a waste of time chuck this in the bin um but we are going to say look that bit where she hits him with the teapot makes no sense whatsoever i had no idea what was happening or i didn't know who was speaking or you know really things because that you don't see because you're too close in so I, I do recommend buddying you know just have a writing partner of some kind um whether within a larger group or you know somebody who but you look at their i mean if sometimes people students especially you know they have flatmates and they have a flatmate who looks at their work who isn't a writer um and that can that can also work i mean it's just to, you know it's, it's to do with having and as a as a you know published writer if you have an editor like this because because editing is way more of the process than anybody ever tells you <laughs> i mean your own editing and then um so the other advice that i always give to writers is that nothing you see in print was anybody's first draft so if you look mm. at your first draft, oh my God, this is a disaster. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm like, you know, and despair. It, nothing that you see in print is, mm. is, you know, is, is anybody's first draft. It's been through numerous redraftings by themselves. It's been looked at by other people often, you know, it's had suggestions from other people. It's sometimes had, you know, a good sympathetic literary editor is amazing. Um, and they're, they're wonderful if you find one. You know, not everybody has those. <laughs> yeah. There might be, there may be some editors who make you feel as though it's rubbish. Why didn't they throw it in the bin? But you know, you don't want one of those. But somebody who really, who really gets what you're trying to do, and, you know, wants to help you do it by making helpful suggestions. And also, there are things you know, you know, you don't want to get rid of it, but you, you know, you probably should. And if somebody else tells you to, you rep you go okay <laughs> it's true I, I i wished it wasn't true i hoped it wasn't true but they may tell you no that's crucial that episode is crucial and you can leave it in and that's also nice um but yes i think and i, I sort of i mean sometimes when i look at my work and i think god if i if i was a creative writing student and i showed this to myself i know exactly what i would say was wrong with it but it's unbelievably difficult okay. to do it when it's yourself 
to go you know what mm. that's got to go you know i love that turn of phrase mm. but it's just wrong so mm. yes yes my advice is is, yeah. is find friends <laughs> find friends and keep do and do it do it and don't worry about you know because everything you're writing you don't have to publish everything you write you don't have to show it everything you write it's not about and don't get hung up on the idea of whether you have something earth shattering to say or whether you're as a, and i think this is a problem especially if you study literature of this sort of i there's a kind of prevailing idea that you know it's about the state of your soul in a way that other subjects aren't and you know it's really it's really well i suppose this is where studying the 17th century helps in the classical period in the 17th century poetics was a branch of rhetoric it's just about whether you can persuade somebody else can you persuade somebody else that the world is as you think it is or that this thing happened or that these people um are interesting and you want to find out what happened to them it's really can it's about persuasion and if you focus on that does it work doesn't it work so in any creative writing class i teach it's we are really not focused on you know are you really Shakespeare we're focused on you know does this piece of dialogue persuade anybody that that it was as it as you say it was and hopefully that lets people off the hook people should be off the hook more than they are <laughs> I think in general so as a uh, as a teacher again I would uh, do you suggest aspiring writers poets uh, to take creative writing courses to enroll themselves uh, to learn does that help what do you think well everybody's everybody's different i didn't ever do a creative writing course but i think actually and i think i would have been petrified <laughs> to do it i would have been absolutely terrified to do a creative writing course so i can't really you know to share my work and to you know not have everything perfect before you know i think that would be but i so it may not be for everybody and yeah, I think, and obviously, yeah, I mean, it's, there are, there are, but I do think you need to do it and keep doing it and revising it, write a lot. I mean, and, and if something doesn't work, leave it and go on to the next thing and then come back to that first thing again. Every single thing you write doesn't have to be perfect straight away. And you might find, you know, you come back 10 years later and you go, that was a really good idea. I could do something else with that. Or I could, or actually, I quite like that. I mean, almost nothing that you wrote 10 years ago, you would write in that way now anyway. But then if you, if, you know, then you, but you wrote it then it's fine. You know, you, <laughs> a writing life is like any other life. It moves forward. So just, just do, just do it. And don't, don't feel bad about it. <laughs> That's my advice. I don't know. Is that helpful? Yeah. <laughs> No, that was uh, quite uh, helpful. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of questions, but still. And read. Uh, That's the other thing. Do read. Do read things. I mean, read things, but it, read a whole load of things. Read, read, you know, don't, you don't, it's very difficult to read things and not start, you know, pastiching them a bit, but that's also fine. Um, mm -hmm. But read random things and read things that aren't very good. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's that's often actually quite inspiring. You go, well, I could do a better job of that. I mean, if you're always reading people who do things so much better than you could ever hope to do it, it gets a bit dispiriting. But if you read something and you go, well, actually, if I set that in a completely different place, I could do something like that, or I could do something, you know, better than that. Or it doesn't have to be. I could do something with that that was different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just get get ideas from places, and that you can get ideas from all kinds of places and from all kinds of reading, children's books, and you know, newspapers, anything, bits off the radio. Uh, can you suggest some? Uh, since uh, you specialize in short story, uh, I mean, when I was a student, I used to read a lot of Raymond Carver. It was uh, mm -hmm. suggested by. Uh, uh, my supervisor Wayne Price. Is, uh, yeah, Wayne loves they, Wayne loves Raymond well, Carver. But Wayne McCarver is great. Yes. Yeah, I was in uh, Alan Spence uh, Spence's class as well. So, uh, what are your favorites like to share with the audience? Like short story writers. Uh, that yeah. You, uh, um, read? Well, I'm trying to think about the things that I I, I read. I I mean, when I was 
starting out i i influential short stories i read a collection of short stories by uh a, well ukrainian russian um writer called isaac babel called red cavalry i remember which are are set in the sort of the, the war between poland and soviet union in the 20s um that had a huge impact on me and those are fantastic stories i, I recommend, recommend those and i also read um a polish writer called bruno schultz um who has written well he's written lots of things well he he, he was killed in the holocaust um but he wrote a book called Street of Crocodiles is a good starter, I think, Ulitsa Crocodili. And and he also wrote um Sanatorium Sanator how is it translated? Um in Polish it's Sanatorium Podkleb Sidron. Uh Sanatorium under the sign of the hourglass, I think it's called in English. Um and I mean they just I mean they just felt like and because I was in Poland, they just felt enormously kind of he's beautiful stylist but they just felt enormously atmospheric as a, as a way of conveying certain things about pre-war poland that were were amazing grace paley i would recommend grace paley if you want to start she, she's a jewish american writer and activist and she's um so she's written essays as well um i think she's there's she died in the 2008 maybe um but she wrote she, her collection of essays that she came out in the 90s is called Just As I Thought, which mm. is worth looking at. But her, she wrote uh, Enormous Changes at the Last Minute, I think was a collection of short stories that she that I really liked. But if you if you Google her, you'll find there's a short story on you can find quite easily online called Want, which is about giving back your library books. I think <laughs> I think that's a really good. It's very short. And yeah, it's a really good start for Grace Paley. I would I would rec recommend her. Um, and more recently, obviously, Claire Keegan, I think, is, is wonderful. Um, and her latest one is called Small Things Like These, which is not short stories, but it's a novella. So she's written, um, she writes short stories um, and she came to the Word Festival a couple of times and she came and did creative writing, uh, amazing creative writing workshops. Uh, and yes, and lots of the things that she, she said actually about writing. Um, about the way one sentence leads to another, and she she would sort of unpick that in a in a class. Where yeah, have stayed stayed with me for a long time. So yeah, Claire Keegan is is contemporary. I would recommend Irish writer. Um, and when I was starting the way back when I was at sort of college, I read the com collected works short stories of D. H. Lawrence, and D. H. Lawrence is a problematic person for all sorts of reasons and quite annoying. Um, but but I, I think, but what, what I thought, what I thought was wonderful about Lawrence, and what was, I mean, when you're a child, um, and I don't know, maybe lots of writers are like this. You you kind of meet with a certain amount of healthy scepticism about your veracity, about it, whether, you, whether you're making things up all the time, and um, I guess you want to the way that you see the world doesn't get to prevail when you're a child and when you're a writer you get to hopefully persuade people at least temporarily that the world is the way you see it and i thought with lawrence lawrence is so didactic and he has all these agendas and all this stuff and he's always pushing them down your throat but it, the wonderful thing about lawrence um aside from all the sexism and neo-fascism and all those things um was was that his annoyingness was part of why he was good. I don't you, that you I, I found that really very helpful that you didn't have to separate out what was annoying about you from what you were trying to do, even if I didn't want to be a sort of, you know, if you had things that you wanted to teach people or things that you wanted to sort of ram down their throats, it didn't preclude you from being a writer, um, though maybe you shouldn't ram them down their throats too much. Mm. Yes. No, that was so, very, very informative, Helen. Helpful list yeah. or not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hope so you don't mind. I think Lawrence is not not fashionable yeah. anymore, but Lawrence was kind of compulsory when I was a student. So yeah. for all kinds of reasons. That was uh, very informative, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, there's a very interesting question which uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask about your hobbies, okay. but still. Uh, if we can, uh, if I, if I'm uh, not mistaken, at the back of your wall, there's a, uh, is that a poster of the Word Festival? Is it? Oh yes, this is the Wayward Festival. Yes, which is a kind of, it was a Word Festival started by my colleague Alan Spence in 
1999-2000 and it was a fantastic literary festival in, in Aberdeen and um, people came from far and wide and it was wonderful. Um, and uh, subsequently there was a, uh, it was kind of swallowed up into a larger research festival, but the, the kind of literary part of it, I think a lot of people missed. And so in 2020, we I got together with a group of students and we really wonderful group of students. We we got put together a festival called Wayward, which was kind of led. So so the idea was that there would be it would join together student audience who didn't get to come to the May Festival because it was after their after their exams and they were gone home. Um, and also these people who who like to go to literary festivals and but that we would make it you know it would have some music and some you know street art and zines and comics and yeah it would have unconventional forms of expression is the tagline so it's a kind of mixture so it has it has well-known authors and people you might not have heard of but are doing amazing and interesting work in all kinds of areas and it's yes it's it's now in the third third year of it and hopefully it's going to be completely face well almost completely face to face this year touch wood so the first year it was completely online, obviously, because it was 2020. Last year it was mostly online. Um, we had 47 events last year, which was wow. huge. Um, but we had about seven of them in person. We did manage to do that. And yeah, the idea is it's a mixture of, of genres and artists. And we always kind of, you know, so we had last year we had a, a cultural translation panel, people, South Asian writers, three very different South Asian women writers all talking about um, you know, their experiences of writing and publishing in, in English. Um, and uh, we had a creativity, disability, neurodiversity panel with people talking about, you know, how that their differences in that respect impacted on their work. And yeah, we, this year we got a queer horror panel and a performing identities mm -hmm. panel and all sorts of stuff. So there are workshops, there are panels and there are author events. So um, We've got um, Raymond Antrobus is going to come and be our headline poet, so that'll be nice. And we've got all sorts of other people, which you have not going to tell you about, because you need to go to www.waywardfestival.com. You can see last year's. If you if you go to that website, you can see videos from from last year, which is quite fun, as well as um, last year's program. And then the new program will be announced in July. Oh, so twenty first okay. to the twenty fifth of September. And there will be online hybrid options. So hopefully some of the people who are far afield in this audience can come to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's very informative, Helen. So if any author, uh, let's say uh, from any foreign countries, if they would like to join that to contact uh, the word office, is it? Or is it, uh, how does that work? They can just, they can email me. Oh. Um, we do have a way, we do have a way word at abdn.ac.uk email address um but it's probably quicker to just do h.lynch at abdn.ac.uk and just get in touch and say you know because agents get in touch publishers get in touch writers get in touch and you know we always we try and you know consistent with not having a festival that's three weeks long which is <laughs> which is quite tempting because it's really hard to resist a good idea um but yeah we do the planning we start the planning for it in sort of november october november the previous year so if you want to if you want to get in early <laughs> to be in the first mix but the idea is it's it's we have a caucus of students of students and young people from across the city and then we have a committee who actually um and me and my colleagues from the staff at aberdeen and we put together this this program um between us which is way more interesting in my opi humble opinion than if if you know if i just sat there and picked writers i think it's much more interesting to have a you know, you, you think the things that you wouldn't think of are always more interesting in general. So beautiful. I love that uh, saying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> anyway, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it's just uh, one hour past, but uh, one of the, it was uh, what I found quite interesting is you're part of a solid band, Dance Macabre. Is that oh, yes. Pronounced it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's the ladies only band, is it? Uh, it's it's, so it's been it's always been all women yes it's been all women yeah. since the start um it started in 2003 with my daughter who was a, a pianist she was a classical mm -hmm. pianist and she was at the aberdeen city music school 
And so together with a fiddle player and a cellist from the music school, we started the band in 2003. And then they all went off to music college and, you know, dispersed. And I had to decide, well, do we carry on or, you know, and do we carry on on the same basis? And I thought, yes, it's, it's too nice to stop. So, so we had um, Francis Wilkins on concertina and Anne Taylor on keyboard and Claire White from Shetland on fiddle. And um, yes, it's basically Francis has now lives in Sky and has um, got three children. So we just joke that she's been on extended maternity leave. <laughs> so, so it's it's basically been the three of us um, since then. But yes, it's it's lovely. It's a lovely thing. I mean, you just get to go to other people's parties and get paid, and you get to make people dance, which is so nice as to, as a as a thing to do. And it's such an easy. I don't know, for people who don't know in Scotland, you know, Kaylee is just a regular, not for the last two years, obviously, but, you know, weddings, student events, birthday parties, anniversaries, or just um, public Kayleys in the in the music hall or, you know, in so village halls all over the place. People will just organize a Kaylee, um, you know, pay a band to come along, have some stovies, probably traditional, traditional stovies okay. with beetroot and oat cakes at the break and yeah just dance and you can if you have a dance caller which we do um mm. you know you can make sure that everybody knows what to do scottish dancing is not very difficult in the sense that it's you just have to be roughly in the right place at the right time so so if you have a dance caller and you walk it through everybody can do it you can do it no prior experience necessary so yeah it's just it's just really really nice and i play the whistle i should explain yeah um, and can, can we at last uh, listen to your whistle, you know. I haven't got it. Well, you wanted to play the whistle. Uh, I actually haven't got a whistle. whistle here. Um, I tell you what, there's a, there's a link to there's a link I sent you. If you, you can hear it, you can hear the whistle on that. There's a link. If you put that in there, if you include that, they can hear some whistle on that. I'm sorry, I don't know what. I think my whistle's downstairs because I've got to go and play it tomorrow. So I've packed a bag all ready to go off to, okay. to perform. So, sorry. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, but yeah, the, I, I think it's uh, uh, Scottish traditional music, is it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of jigs and reels, and um, we we sneak a few Polish tunes in there, and you know mm. you can sneak sneak other things, marches, so hornpipes. Yes, it's just a mixture of mixture of things. But yes, it's just have have a there's there's a listen button on the website. <laughs> if you put that in, you can get the idea of what kind of what kind of music it is. But yeah, it's just basically for people to have a have a good time and do some do some dances and you know hopefully not spread covid between each other <laughs> <laughs> no, i mean it was it was it was an activity that was obviously very heavily you know suspended during covid because it is it you know it's very social but it's lovely yeah really yeah. glad I, I didn't ever think at the start that i would still be doing it <laughs> now uh -huh. but just too good to give up uh... Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Helen. It was wonderful to listen to you. And I can see that uh, uh, in between the Zoom uh, link and uh, uh, the Facebook, uh, there's been an audience from uh, the US, from India, from Nepal. So, and I can see uh, uh, some writers as well, you know, some poets. So it's wonderful. And this will all, all, uh, this will be uh, up, uploaded in the uh, uh, YouTube as well. So. Uh, those who couldn't be here can watch later on. But thanks once again. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll put all the links. Uh, okay, the, thank uh, you. Yes. Yeah, well, thank you to them. everybody for coming as well. And thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and keep writing. And I hope, I hope, you know, I hope to read other people's writing. I hope to come yeah. across it soon. Lastly, uh, I would like to thank the Scottish Book Trust for sponsoring this event. And it was wonderful to have you, Dr. Helen. Have a good day. And thanks to all uh, friends. Uh, we have a uh, small message over here. Very informative and uh, inspiring session. Wonderful session. Thank you, oh, thank Navin you. and Helen, for your wisdom. Oh, thank so, you. <laughs> with that, I would like to end today's program. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.